Okay, folks, time for a little bit of homework help. I'm going to help you guys out with assignment 17. We'll see how well it goes. Maybe we'll even hop in and do a little bit of 18 if we can, uh, if this goes smoothly. So, assignment 17. Now, if you have the blue book, that's page 209, and we begin with problem number two. And that says, identify and define three major types of chemical bonding. Now, we talked about two very specifically in class, and I'm going to give you those two. Ionic was the first one we talked about. Then we talked about covalent, and one that we're not going to talk about for a bit yet, I'm going to give that one to you as well, is metallic. Now if you look in section one, you can get the definitions for each of these. Okay, so that's the first question on tonight's homework. Next question is number three. And number three says, what is the relationship between electronegativity and the ionic character of a bond? So the relationship between electronegativity and the ionic character. So remember, electronegativity is how well two atoms share electrons. Um, if there's unequal sharing, there's a big electronegativity difference. That means one atom has a high electronegativity and the other atom has a low electronegativity. The greater the difference, the greater the ionic character. So to answer question number three, um, what is the relationship between electronegativity and the ionic character? Electronegativity increase. Actually, I want to change that. I want to use the word increase. I want to say electronegativity difference uh, becomes greater. Oh, my handwriting is just atrocious tonight, isn't it? So as electronegativity difference becomes greater, the bond becomes more ionic. That means there is less sharing and more of a transfer of electrons. Okay, so think about that. Number four, that's our next one. It says, what is the meaning of the term polar as applied to chemical bonding? So part A wants you to find what polar means as it applies to chemical bonding. Maybe look that one up on yourself and uh, by yourself and do that on your own. I think you can handle it. And then part B says distinguish between polar covalent and nonpolar covalent. So polar covalent means there is an electronegativity difference between atoms. And I should say between bonding atoms more specifically. And what do you think nonpolar covalent is? Well, I'm going to leave you guys to that. I'm going to leave that one to you guys to do yourself. Okay? So polar covalent means the electronegativity difference. We have one between bonding atoms. Nonpolar covalent, I think you guys can figure that one out. The next one you have to do is number six. And number six reads, determine the electronegativity difference, the probable bond type, and the more electronegative atom with respect to the bonds formed between the following pairs of atoms. And then it says to see sample problem A from section number one in your book. So the first one is H and I. Okay, so we have to find out, first of all, determine the electronegativity difference. So, we're going to flip over. It's page 161 in your book, so I'm going to flip over to that quickly. Where it lists some electronegativities for us. And this is also found in your notes. Hydrogens is 2.1, and iodine is 2.5. Okay, so let's go ahead and write those down. Hydrogens, electronegativity was 2.1, iodine was 2.5, so the electronegativity difference is 0.4. Are we okay with that? The second part of the question said the probable bond type. So bond type. Now I'm going to look at sample problem A to give me a little guidance on this, okay? And just to show you guys how to use your book, we're going to flip over quickly to section one, way at the beginning. And we're going to try to find uh, 
Sample problem one. And we see we can find the electronegativity difference. Here it's 0.4, just like the one that we're doing right now. And it says that that is polar covalent. So we have an electronegativity difference. We will call it polar covalent. So move that out of the way. Polar covalent. Okay. I'll do letter B for you as well. That's S and O. S and O. So the electronegativity of sulfur, once again, just flipping over to page 161, or you guys can use that same chart that you can find in your textbook. It says the electronegativity of sulfur is 2.5, and the electronegativity of oxygen is 3.5. So the electronegativity difference is 1.0, and this one's also polar covalent. Remember from our notes, if that gets bigger than 1.7, then we're going to call it ionic. Um, if there's a difference at all, we're going to call it co polar covalent, and if there's no difference, we're going to call it nonpolar covalent. So let's do letter C. We've got to flip back over. Keep on changing pages here. Letter C is K and BR. And this will be the last one I'm going to do for you. After that, you kiddos are going to be on your own here. Potassium's electronegativity is 0.8. So pretty doggone small. Bromine is 2.8. So the difference here, obviously, is 2.0. And that's greater than 1.7. Remember, 1.7 is the breaking point. It becomes more than 50% ionic. So I would classify the bond between K and BR as being ionic. Okay, And you can finish off the rest of number 6 on your own. Number 7 says, so this is number 7, Okay, it says list the bonding pairs described in number 6 in order of increasing covalent character. So you're going to take these up above, and you want to go from in order of increasing covalent. So you want to put the most ionic first, and you, then you want the last one to be the most covalent. So the way you're going to do that is we're going to have the big electronegativity difference here, big EN difference here, and the most covalent we are going to have is the small EN difference. So we're listening in order of increasing covalent character. So most ionic to most covalent. All right. After number seven, we only have one more question on this assignment, and that is number nine. So let's see what number nine is all about. Number nine says the lattice energy of NaCl, the lattice energy, is equal to negative 787.5 kilojoules per mole. And the lattice energy of potassium chloride is negative 715 kilojoules per mole. Um, in which compound is the bonding between ions going to be stronger? So based upon um, lattice energy, we have to write down which one we think is going to be stronger. And I'm going to give you this answer. It's going to be a freebie to those kids that are listening right now. NaCl has the stronger bond, and it's related to the lattice energy. As lattice energy increases, the bond strength also increases. Okay? So that's a freebie on assignment number 17. And believe it or not, that's all we have to do for assignment 17. We're done. So that shouldn't be too bad. Get that wrapped up, and you should be able to get some easy points. Hey, we still have a few minutes left. So let's move on. How about if I help you out a little bit with assignment number 18? Now, assignment number 18 in the blue book is also beginning on page 209, and it goes to 210. And the first one I want you to do is number 15. So number 15 reads, determine the number of valence electrons in the following atoms. So I'll do a few of these for you. We have H, F, M, G, and I'll do one more for you. I'm going to get move tonight. We'll do aluminum for you. So we want to have the number of valence electrons. 
Now hopefully you guys remember that that's related to the group number. The last digit in the group number tells you how many valence it has. So hydrogen's in group number one. It's the first group on the periodic table. We said it have, would have one valence electron. Fluorine is all the way over here. So we start on, on one side, one, two, and then we go three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Fluorine's in group number 17. So it has seven valence electrons. Remember its configuration ends with 2s2, 2p5, a total of seven valence. Magnesium, it's in group two. Its configuration ends with 3s2, so it has two valence electrons. And aluminium is over here in group 13. Its configuration ends with 3s2, 3p1, for a total of three valence. I think you can handle the rest of number 15 on your own. Knowing how to find the number of valence electrons is very important when we start drawing Lewis structures. And that takes us to number 21. So number 21 reads, draw Lewis structures for each of the following. So letter A, we have one carbon atom and we have four fluorine atoms. So the way that we do that is we first find out how many valence electrons I have to work with. Each carbon atom has four valence. Now I found that by looking at its group number. It's in group 14. It has four valence. Its configuration ends with 2s2, 2p2, which is a total of four. Um, either way, it has four valence. Fluorine, there are four of them, and fluorine is in group 17, so it has seven valence. So I have a total of 32 valence electrons that I have to work with here when I draw the Lewis structure. Now we have to find a center atom. Is it going to be carbon or fluorine? Well, let's put carbon in the middle. And then we're going to put fluorine on four sides. Nature tends to be symmetrical. So we'll stick carbon in the middle and put fluorine on the four sides. We'll put a pair between carbon and each of the fluorines. And there you see, now carbon has its octet, four pairs, and I've used eight of my 32. Then each fluorine needs a full octet. So this one needs six more, or three pairs. This one needs six more. This one needs six more. And this one needs six more. If you count them up, I've used 32 valence. That is my Lewis structure when I have one carbon and four fluorines. Let's do letter B for you. And letter B is one, uh, two hydrogens and one selenium. So two H's and one selenium. Now, each hydrogen has one valence. It's in group one. And selenium, there's one of those, and that's in group six of the periodic table. Sorry, 16. So it has six valence. So I have eight valence electrons to work with. Now, once again, nature tends to be symmetrical. We'll put selenium in the middle, hydrogen on one side, and hydrogen on the other. And we'll put a pair between selenium and each hydrogen. So now hydrogen satisfied. Remember, it's one of our exceptions to the octet rule. It only needs a pair. And then we'll complete selenium's octet with my other valence. I'm allowed eight, and I have eight dots. So there's my Lewis structure for two hydrogens and a selenium. Okay? I think you guys can handle the rest of 21 on your own. There'll be some challenges there, but I'll let you struggle with those. Okay, next up is number 23. Draw Lewis structures for each of the following. Letter A is O2. Now, we have two oxygens. They're in group 16, so six valence apiece. So I'm allowed 12 valence here. Now, this is how a lot of you kiddos are going to start. You're going to put O next to O. Great start. You're going to put a pair between them. And then you're going to give this oxygen a full octet. See, it has eight electrons now. And this oxygen a full octet. It also has eight, right? Each has eight electrons. What's the problem? Well, I've used two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen valence. I'm only allowed twelve. When that happens, try having those atoms share two pairs of electrons. That's called a double covalent bond. So if this oxygen already has two pairs, it only needs two more pairs to give it a full octet. And the same is true with this oxygen. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. This oxygen for part of the time has 8 electrons. 
and this oxygen for part of the time has eight electrons, but they had to share two pair to do that. Another way to draw that is drawing two lines between the oxygens which represent those two pairs. Then we can do a pair above and a pair below to complete the octet. So either one of those Lewis structures are just fine. Should we do one more and call it good? Letter B, N2. So nitrogen's in group 15. Oh, we have two nitrogens. Each one has five valence, so that's a total of ten valence. Try to put them next to each other, sharing one pair. We already tried this just a moment ago with my oxygens. That's 14. Too many. So maybe they could share two pair. All right, let's see if that works. See, each nitrogen has eight. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. We're only allowed ten. That doesn't work. If sharing two pair doesn't work, we have to step up and they share three pairs. So for part of the time, this nitrogen has six electrons already. It only needs one more pair. And this nitrogen has six electrons already. It only needs one more pair. I've used two, four, six, eight, ten. Another way to illustrate this is drawing three lines between the nitrogens to represent those three shared pairs and a pair on the outside of each nitrogen. Either one of those is just fine. Okay, that gives you a great running start on the next two assignments. I hope you use this time and video to your advantage. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Bye-bye.